Et nous allons maintenant euh, inviter euh, Madame Anna Téchier Rodimel, euh, chercheuse au Centre d'études sociales de l'Université de Coimbra. Anna Téchier Rodimel est titulaire d'un doctorat en psychologie clinique de l'Université de Coimbra et du, et, euh, du titre de spécialiste en psychologie clinique sous spécialité en psychologie communautaire par l'ordre portugais de psychologue. Aujourd'hui, le titre de la conférence, c'est « Améliorer l'intuition clinique en tant que pensée complexe de second ordre, fondement et défi en activiste. Euh, » Madame Teixeira, je vous invite à partager votre écran, s'il vous plaît. La parole est à vous et euh, pour tout le monde, je vous demande d'aller euh, euh, moins vite pour faciliter la, le travail de nos, nos collègues euh, traducteurs. À vous. Merci. Um, I'm not quite sure about not speaking very fast. I will try, but I'm not very good with it. So please just make me loads of warnings. So I'm going to make you a number of requests for this presentation. I would like it to be present and I would like it to have action. So to be a presentation. So what I'm going to ask is for you to be a part of this presentation and to help me somehow bring it forth or enact it. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'd like to everyone in the panelist that would be willing to be a part of my presentation and to help me bring it forth to please keep your videos on. Um, I will try with this presentation to somehow enact also some of the many principles that were talked today. And I would like to enter in a relation with you and to couple with you instead of just talking to myself, you know, in my little square here. So I will ask anyone who will be willing to be a part of the presentation to put their, um, their, their things on. And I'm gonna ask please if anyone from the participants there are on the other side of the screen, If you would please like to join us, I would like for maybe six to eight volunteers. So if the attendees will just raise their electronic hand on Zoom, the technical people will bring you into this side of the panel so that we can see you and you can be a part of this conversation too. So um, if you wouldn't mind just shaking your hand so that they can pick you up. And once you are on this side, please share um, your screen. So we have one person. Um, and I'm hoping that more will join, please. Um, just please just raise your hand. And while you do so, and I'm uh, hoping that we'll have more volunteers, I will try to briefly explain how we're gonna um, play this presentation. And I hope that this will be a bit of a play um, because it is in play also that we exist as humans and that we mediate somehow our more basic and grounded and embodied activities with the more abstract uh, higher order activities. Um, Eduardo has raised his hand. You're already on this side, so thank you. Uh, I don't know if you want to say something, but if you do, you can just uh, unmute yourself. I would ask for the other people in the attendees, please join us. And I will ask for the technical support people to bring those people, there's already Felix, I guess. Um, to bring those people into this site because um, I'd really like to have and I would um, recommend that you would use the gallery view on Zoom so that we can all um, see each other as much as possible. So I will be talking to you when doing this presentation and I'll be looking at your reactions, I'll be looking at your faces and I'll be trying to understand what is of interest to you. So I have shared a link also uh, while we wait for more volunteers to join. I will share, um, um, you probably already see my screen, um, but I will share, I've always, I, I also shared a link in the chat with a mural board with which you can interact where this presentation will happen. So um, just a couple of cues here, technical ones, just, just a couple. If you want to move around on, on this left side, you'll find a little hand and that's why we'll help you move around my presentation. If you want to select an object like to Write on it, you have to have the arrow on and you double click on an object and you can just write on it. Um, so this is our arena. This is where my presentation will take place. And you'll see that in this board, you'll have 
loads of materials that might or might not be of interest that you might feel or not curious about and you might want to know things. So in case you want to know things about this object, just ask me. So I decided to make this presentation non-linear. I'm not going to start with an end and finish in the other because I have things to say, but I don't really know what interests you. And in fact, what I might have to say might not be as interesting as the things that you might have to say. So I might learn something also if you challenge me in this presentation. So what I did was I picked up my abstract, which you find here on the left, and I kind of like, I broke it apart. I picked up loads of words that relate to my abstract and loads of words that come to my mind when I think about the things that I would like to share with you about this presentation. And um, Francisco has read the title of my presentation and it's about enhancing clinical intuition as second order complex thinking. Um, now, what you have here is a series of words and I will ask you to play with me. And the challenge is I will ask you to pick up a word and for another person to pick up another word and you will be inviting me to bring these words or you can just bring the words directly here, for example, into the arena. And I will try to make my presentation by trying to establish a relation between those words. And in, in, in that sense, we will be weaving the presentation together. So because you may start anywhere, I don't really have my speech prepared. So I'm going to try. I'm going to also find out something about what it is that I know um, through you know, relating to you and to the challenges that you're going to pose. Now, you'll probably be perturbed by this presentation in many ways. You know, my words will bring you into different types of places. So if you have things and places that you go to that you find interesting and that might enrich eventually this discussion, you're free to bring those ideas to the front too and to the conversation. And you'll see that there are a couple of uh, empty little papers here that you might just decide to put some things on. Um, so I'll weave my presentation here, but there are other things around. I do have some PowerPoints, but I thought it would be tremendously boring at this time of the night. And after you've heard so many wonderful presentations, you probably don't want to hear another one uh, because it was not going to be so wonderful. And it is very late and we're all tired, but I might come to them if you are interested in any of the concepts uh, that might appeal to these presentations. And I also have some images because this is a presentation about practice and about doing. And I am a clinician, I'm a psychologist and I work with practitioners. And if you're interested also in any of these images, just call me my attention to them and I will talk about them too. Um, so pretty much we're gonna go on an adventure for, um, I, I'm guessing I have around 40 minutes, but if I don't just correct me, I'm gonna put my timer here, but you can also, um, tell me things. Now, you'll see that there are two boxes here. What I will invite you to do is to think about my presentation and to challenge me. And this, this symbol here, you can write on it by using some of the sticky notes here. You can write by double clicking on a sticky note. And if you double click, you can just write something and then you can move it. If you think that my presentation brings about interesting things about the foundations of an inactive approach, you can write it here. If you think that my presentation uh, raises issues about the prospects of the inactive approach or questions that still need to be tackled and addressed, you can write it here. And if you just have general comments or resonances, you can just write them wherever is available. Okay, you have, you have these balloons here, but you also have post-its here, or you can just unmute yourself and we can chat. So someone has asked me to talk about complex thinking. Is that it? Uh, who was it? Can you raise your hand? Cool. Someone brought these things here. Okay, um, I don't know who was, please identify yourself so that I can look at you, but um, I'm gonna, I don't know if it was someone from the other side of the screen, if there are participants that still want to be a part of this, just raise your electronic hand and the technicians will bring you into this side of the screen, please. Okay, so you probably, uh, I'm gonna make, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a relation and I'm gonna have to talk about these two themes, but I'm afraid they might be the more, the ones that might take me more time. <laughs> and um, the, like, probably the less interesting ones. But this presentation is grounded in a relational worldview, and that's why relational is there. In the idea that everything that exists, exists in a relation, and everything that can be known can only be known through a relation. So it's grounded both in an ontological worldview, which has a relation is somehow the, the basic entity that we can deal with, and also um, 
it, 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 in an epistemological um, perspective based on relations. So what I am proposing, and this presentation is grounded in a proposal, a, a reconceptualization of complex thinking, building on the shoulders of giants like Edgar Morin, as a mode of coupling, a particular mode of coupling with the world. And I will talk you just a little bit about the theoretical foundations of this. And then if you're more interested, I'll just bring about, bring, bring more things. And because someone has put emergence here, I will try to make the connection between uh, both of these themes. So what do I mean when I talk about complex thinking? And what do I mean when I talk about complex thinking from a relational perspective? Um, this, I'm gonna go here on my slides, okay? And you probably can see them too. Um, and I'm gonna open this slide here that you can manipulate on your own if you want to on the board. But this proposal of complex thinking is presented in this tiny little book that has come out quite recently that's called Performing Complexity. And it presents a view of uh, complex thinking, like I said, grounded in this relational worldview and building on, on the work of Moran. I'm just gonna change a lot of, jump through a lot of things here because you didn't ask about them. So I'm not gonna go through these things. Um, but I wanted to say, call attention that when Moran um, looked at the field, the emergent field of complexity, he noticed how clearly there were two different approaches being taken. One that was more restricted and not really taking into account the epistemological implications of understanding the world as, um, as, um, as I'm sorry, someone, pop, there was a question popping here, but I think that was not for me. <laughs> uh, that's why I stopped. Um, so, Moran challenged us to embrace complexity at the level of our modes of thinking and thinking if we want to understand the complexity of our world, we need to develop modes of thinking that need to be congruent also with that complexity. And this is the basic assumption of, of this work. Right? But complexity, as we see it, is not something or the way that this perspective presents it, it's not something that's out there in the world. And it's not something also that's a property of an observer. It's clearly a relational property, something that comes out of the relation between an observer and a world that it enacts in the coupling with it. And so to some extent, when we talk about complexity, we're talking about something that evolves and that evolves in a relationship. But that we could treat as if it was independent on the observer just for the sake of the conversation um, by you know, putting under brackets a bunch of assumptions that I won't go into it unless you ask me to talk about this later. But when I talk about complex thinking, I'm talking about one particular mode of knowing um, as one particular mode of coupling with the world that could be defined both as a process and as, a, as, as an outcome. So it is grounded in the idea that you know through the coupling, that um, our coupling with each other and with other entities, uh, that our engagement in relations generate constraints and generates differences and differences that make a difference and are perceived as such um, and that reveal something about our own internal structures, about our own contributions to the world, about the systems that we interact with, about the nature of our coupling itself. Okay, so I'll be moving forward and I'm going to say I'm going to define complex thinking as a mode of coupling with the world that on, to, to on one hand somehow attends to, describes, explains, anticipates and adjusts to the complexity of a selected part of the world or that it's capable, capable of attending to a certain number of prep properties as currently recognized by, the, by a community of observers that would be uh, falling under this umbrella of uh, complexity sciences or, or, or complexity thinking. So to some extent, this corresponds to the contents of the thinking and will be very close to what some people have called complexity thinking or complex systems thinking. So it's our ability to somehow identify particular properties in the systems that we interact with. Um, as I said, recognized by a particular community of observers, and I'm putting this under, 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 under brackets because they don't, don't exist necessarily out there. We have uh, somehow created them also. But this is a mode of thinking that not only is capable of recognizing particular properties of what have been de defined as complex systems, but somehow enacts these same properties through the process of thinking in the mode of coupling with those systems of interest. A particular type of mode of coupling that enacts in the coupling with the system of interest the same properties that we recognize in complex, in complex systems. It can also be defined as an outcome of that coupling that recursively feeds that process. And it might result in a, complexity, in a multiplicity of descriptions, of explanations, of anticipations, and our capacity also to establish relationships between them. 
It might result in novel emergent information that's meaningful in terms of improving the coherence of our coupling with the systems that we're interacting with. It will result in a wider variety of possibilities for action that might guide uh, our management of ourselves in the world and in a relation with other systems. And it will support more constructive interactions and a positive co-evolution with these target systems of interest. Um, now, I wanna know that when I talk about the complexity of the thinking, we're talking about complexity and I, no one has asked me about complexity, so I'm not gonna talk too much about that. But I will say that when I talk about complexity, I'm talking about differentiation, I'm talking about integration, I'm talking about emergence and recursivity as some uh, core elements to define complexity. And when I'm talking about complexity, I am always talking about a concept that is relative. I, although I'm talking about it as if it was absolute, it is relevant to the position of different observers in relation to what they might identify as different or similar uh, systems of interest. Um, and I, I, won't, I won't go here for now, but I just wanna say this. What I want to say is that in the coupling with our systems of interest, we might then be able to enact a certain number of properties that have been identified in particular systems. And what this framework proposes is that when we do that at the level of our thinking, the outcomes will be more complex too. And there are, there's a wide variety of possibilities of action that will open up. They are more likely to be effective and to, because they build a bigger coherence between any agent or intervener and their target system of interest. Um, so imagine that these different properties of our thinking somehow bring forth a particular reality, a particular dimension of that uh, world that we're dealing with. And, but their interaction um, might bring about more, more um, might bring about not just a synthesis or, or a composition of these lenses, but might bring about and reveal things that we couldn't see with any of these particular lenses per se. So the interaction between these properties of the thinking might lead to what we might call abductive leaps. And they might be small abductive leaps or they might be big abductive leaps. Right? So, and I'm gonna go through this very quickly and then if you ask me questions, I will clarify. Um, what I want to say is that, and I'm going to go here, what we have done is list a certain number of properties that, uh, having been identified in systems that we define as complex, can also be enacted at the level of our thinking. And what we're currently doing is trying to understand to what do these properties correspond to in the ways that we organize ourselves in the world and in the way that we organize our coupling with our systems of interest. And what you see here is a list of these properties. And my proposal is that when we enact these properties at the level of our thinking, if you ask me about some of them, I will, I will detail them. Then what might happen is that um, not only we might find, I'm gonna go back here. Not only we'll have you know, particular pieces of information that emerge that are, um, that, that are congruent with these properties, but if we make these properties interact, we will find ways of dealing with that system in, even, even in conditions of uncertainty. To some extent, using these properties, we'll be able to elaborate different types of explanations, um, what I might call complex intuitions about what might be important for that system of interest that might guide our actions, even if we don't understand the full, um, the full picture. And I don't think I'm being very clear because um, I wanted to avoid to go through the whole of my uh, presentation, but I will go back to this and I hope that I will make this a bit more clear. If you want to go through the slides for some reason, you'll find a description of each one of these uh, properties and that's what I'm uh, going through. And I'm not going to detail them now, but I'm going to go to my first slide again. Sorry. Oh, I can't go to my first slide again because this thing doesn't let me go back. That's okay. That's okay. I wanted to show you. All right. Let's go to let's go to relations and I'll come back to this later. So just think of complex thinking as a process by which we interact with a complex system of interest, enacting properties that we have identified into systems. 
So we can talk about the structural complexity of our thinking, about the diversity of the elements that compose, the diversity of modes of information. We can talk about dynamic complexity. We can talk about uh, dialogic complexity, ethical complexity, aesthetic complexity. Now, these properties then, when they interact, and I'm going to make some connections here in my schema, they might lead to emergence at the level of our thinking. And this is pretty much the basic hypothesis that grounds this work, right? Is that when we deal with the information that we generate with the, in the coupling with our target system of interest, when we deal with that information, applying somehow, uh, enacting these properties, at some point, there will be an abductive leap. There will be something new appearing in our horizon of possibilities in, in, in terms of a new type of description, a new type of explanation, or a new type of anticipation of what might be important for that system of interest that wasn't there before, that wasn't in any of the building blocks of the thinking. So we'll have a sort of abdu abductive leap. And this abductive leap doesn't necessarily come from manipulating the information in terms of uh, sentences or in abstract terms, but it comes from our engagement in that information also, not just in abstract levels, but through our embodiment and through our exploration of those concepts at the more basic level. And I'll try to explain this a bit better um, later. So what I call second order complex thinking is not just the enactment of each of these properties, but it's really this process that leads to emergence. Um, and this has to do with how I establish. So when I think, talk about complex thinking, I'm talking really about a way of establishing a relationship with a target system of interest that becomes more complex than I am. And to some extent, that coupling relationship through top-down effects is then capable of guiding me in the action and in choosing courses of action in managing somehow a given situation. Um, so concepts, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick up here on concepts and see what do concepts have to do with this. So I am a psychologist and I train practitioners um, and I train practitioners to deal with cases of what I call multi-challenged families. Families that are exposed to a multiplicity of stresses that makes really, really difficult for interveners to understand what kind of actions are needed. Because as soon as they intervene in one dimension, everything else changes. And most of the time interventions lead to an aggravation of the problems that led the families to be helped in the first place. I also deal with families that have uh, been identified by child protection services for situations, for example, of child abuse and neglect, where practitioners have to make decisions about the potential for change of a given family about the possibility of not of keeping a family, a, a child in a family, and to what extent will that family be capable of changing their patterns of behavior that are currently creating a situation of risk for the child. So we have theories and we teach theories, right? When we teach practitioners also, we develop, we, we, we choose, we give them information that they can conceptualize a case with. But these theories are very abstract and disengaged for the reality of a particular case. And, and, in, and on many occasions, they actually become stumbling blocks. They, they, they come in the way of helping um, the people that we need to help because they have blind spots, because they guide your attention, because they necessarily invite you to establish a particular type of relation with that system of interest that may or may not be um, what, the child, what, what a particular family needs in order to find alternative patterns of, uh, for, for their lives and alternative patterns of relating. So I'm going to go here to the side and I'm going to show you um, a schema, okay? This would be an image of a conceptual model of the family as a complex system, okay? There's loads of concepts in this schema. Um, and, and, and this is the contents of if you want to, what would be a case conceptualization about a given, a given family, which is my system of interest. I'm not gonna go into the contents because they're irrelevant right now, just to tell you that there are a lot of concepts. In this particular case, the model was built to try to identify features of the family that might help us understand their complexity, picking up on what we know about complex systems. So the contents of the thinking will have necessarily some elements of what we might call complexity thinking. But the thinking is not necessarily complex per se, 
just because we're thinking of, you know, the family self-organization or uh, their coupling processes. So the thinking will not necessarily reveal an, um, possibilities for action that will, will allow for, the, for, for us to engage in a productive relationship with the family. And that's what we want. So the, the, a sufficiently complex form of thinking will help, will show my result in very simple actions, even if we have to consider a different number of possibilities, but uh, we'll have to open different possibilities for action. So the contents of the thinking might help, but they're not enough. And sometimes practitioners are so focused on these dimensions that they actually lose the family. And they lose a fundamental dimension also in, in working with the family, which is the relation, and which is how the emergent properties also of our relationship will constrain or not, will shape or not um, our, 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 our pathways and, and open or not more possibilities for change. So what we're doing with these concepts in, in, in what I call a case, a complex case conceptualization process is somehow to break them down and to establish this dynamic relationship between our experience of the family, our experience of ourselves in the context of one particular system of interest, but also our experience of our ideas about a family or about our system of interest. So what I'm saying is that concepts are also entities that we relate to as other entities, there are other living entities. And we are very attached to some, you know, others were quite repelled by, but the way we also establish a relationship with these concepts will um, help us see different things in a system of interest. So what we're doing is that we're inviting practitioners to put themselves somehow in these concepts, to try to understand what possibilities of themselves do these concepts allow them you know, what, 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 what possibilities of action when they think under these things. But also to mimic and to apply to when they explore the, the information that arises out of this coupling with the family, to explore the relation between these bits of information that somehow come out of that coupling. And in exploring the relationship between these different bits of information, we'll try to apply some of the properties that we see in complex systems. On the one hand, we'll try to make sure, for example, that there's variety of information. And you can see the properties that I had in the slides there here, in, 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 in this schema here, these are some properties of, of complex, um, what, what I define as complex thinking. And for example, we try to make sure that when exploring these concepts, and what, what you can see here is that scheme there of the family just in, in, in a different organization. And what we're asking people to do is to move between these concepts and literally move, okay? So we build these devices that we call reladoscopes or observatrons. Um, and this is a digital one, which is not a very good one. Before COVID, this is what a reladoscope will look like, okay? An analogical reladoscope. We'll have different pieces of cork board. We have pins that represent concepts and ideas. And we have ideas that come out of exploring relationships between these ideas. So what we do is that we invite people to understand what each of these concepts, how each of these concepts appears to them in the context of the relationship with the family. What do they see? What do they don't see? And sometimes we have to break through um, the, the wall that these concepts have created and help, the, and help practitioners find different things, not only in the concept, but also in opposition or in relation to that concept. So what we do is then explore relations between these concepts and relations between these ideas or not the, not the abstract concepts anymore, but the information that we have about the family that was created in the coupling with it, guided also by these concepts. And we literally ask practitioners to make it to, to just play a bit with the information and to make a tool, bring yourself into the situation, feel yourself in the situation and see what kind of things come. So we have tried to apply the property of structural variety of the thinking to make sure that you have a, not, not only enough concepts, but that each one of these little pins is thick enough in terms of depth, that you have different perspectives in it, that you have different types of information that you have created through your coupling with the family. So we're gonna challenge them and to enrich each of these little bits of information through their own being in the relationship with the family. But then we're gonna ask them to build different trajectories. And we make sure that their thinking is integrated, not just differentiated, but integrated. So we randomly start exploring relationships between these concepts and we deliberately make different types of tools because 
we all know that in, in complex systems, um, there is a sort of path dependency. So the trajectory, the developmental trajectory that you have done is gonna constrain your future choices. So sometimes we think that we're thinking differently, but we're really still stuck in the same type of, of you know, small variations of the same type of thinking. So we ask practitioners to start and to build totally different trajectories between these bits of information and to see also how that changes their experiences with the family, their experience, their recollection of the experiences, but also their current experiences with the, 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 their, their client or with the situation. So what we try to do is that we try to relate this information and then we try to make, make sure that there are enough recursive loops that we go about in, in when we explore, for example, what you see here, and this is um, a mess, right? But uh, it's a mess that made sense during a, a, a conversation and during a relation. So we, we, can, we invited people to build to, with these little colorful threads, um, explore relations between concepts. And as new ideas came, we would put little post-its and other types of forms here and then we explore relations between relations and relations between ideas. But we also make sure that we went back to the original dimensions and then we updated somehow the information with the new experiences that we had and with the new emergent ideas. So the hypothesis behind this process is that if you do this, if you enact some of these properties like structural variety and multidimensionality at the level of your thinking as relationality, recursiveness, if you play with the time scales of your own thinking, if you keep enough ambiguity and uncertainty, you know, while you're developing the thinking and you don't close yourself too uh, early, if you play with the relationship between the parts and holes of your thinking, um, if you um, attend to the how you the trajectory that you're thinking has had and different possibilities that were missed at some point and could be recreated and you know a number of other properties that I'm not going to talk about but maybe I'll talk about these you know if you play with your own positioning in relation to the case and invite all the perspectives if you play with your own experiences and you, you are reflexive in that process if you are aware of your intentionalities in the coupling and the kind of possibilities of, of information that might arise, what we're saying is that somehow in this process, something might happen and new information may come about in the form of hypothesis. And this is the type that abductive leap in the form of new clinical hypothesis that will guide action. And these are not just your common sense intuitions, but they are not just your deductions or inductions from theories. You know, there's something really new, but it somehow fits that system. And it's a piece that will not map the whole system, but will guide your actions so that new information can be created that will further guide your actions. So I won't say much about this unless you ask me. Um, and I'm gonna just check what you put. Okay, so decision-making. So this process of complex thinking and, and through emergence, the idea is really to guide decision making in the face of uncertainty. The idea is that if you stay sufficiently coupled with your, um, and I'm going to see if I can find the conditions here, let me see if I can find the slide, act in the face of uncertainty, okay? So this would allow us for a sort of abductive mapping, a sort of indirect mapping of our target system uh, of interest. And I'm talking here about abduction as it has been treated more recently, um, not just, and someone asked about abduction uh, before. I don't know if I have a slide about abduction here. So, um, I mean, the, the previous presentation talked a lot about uh, abduction, but I'd like to say that pretty much abduction is emergence and is the performance of complexity at the level of our thinking, right? Um, and that when we meet the world, when we meet ourselves, you know, organized the same way as just we know that uh, other systems are organized, that complexity somehow is enacted to at the level of our thinking. So this is just an example of the basic abductive inference that Charles Pierce had talked about, which is more a sort of sentential type of abduction where you have these inferences. And it's this clearly an ampliative type of inference in the sense that what we come out with is something that was not contained in the premises before. And this is clearly what defines uh, uh, or distinguish abductions from other uh, modes of thinking is that it comes with something that wasn't contained in the parts of our thinking before. Um, but also abduction is something that comes and peers talk like a flash 
right? It is a sort of educated intuition, a guided intuition. But somehow, Pierce also said that the mind must have been attuned to the truth of things in order to discover what he has discovered. That somehow it's surprising how these things that seem to come out of nowhere fit. And the actions that follow it somehow fit a particular type of situation. So what we're saying is that fit will be the greatest, the more complex, the more the properties that organize our thinking are uh, like those that we, until so far, we have recognized in certain types of complex systems. Um, so I just wanted to say that there are different types of abduction and not just this kind of sentential abduction, but other authors have been talking about manipulative types of abduction or visual abduction. And Delhi has talked about metaphors and has talked about diagrams and has talked about other ways of playing with the information. So somehow what we try to do is not just play with the words, with the concepts, but is also help practitioners deconstruct and leave these concepts in different ways to experience them in other ways. So what you see here is just one part of the exercise, but I might ask you, for example, if we were doing this face to face, and I would tell you that uh, in, my, in my table, I have, for example, Play-Doh, right? That's something that's always here and colorful pens. And I would probably ask practitioners to try to show me their ideas, not just tell me their ideas, but to try to show me their experience of a particular type of concept in the context of their experience with that family in different ways. And we're creating new modes of relating not just to the concepts, but relating to the system that we're trying to understand and create with different, producing different types of information that then we can relate also in different ways and hopefully in creative ways that will generate this kind of, of abductive leaps. Um, please do know that if you just want to unmute yourself and talk, that's also fine and just challenge me and make questions. Um, otherwise, I would ask for more words. Um, so processes. Um, to some extent, I could, oh, someone, I'm going to put this processes and I'm going to relate it to experiences that someone put here, and I'm going to relate it to complex thinking too. So I'm going to strain, highlight this, that complex thinking as I see it is a process. Right? It's not just an outcome, but is a process, is the way by which our interaction, our coupling unfolds. But it has to do with our contributions to that coupling, with what we bring also into that coupling relationship. And to some extent, the experience in, generated in that coupling is going to produce information that then is going to feed back on, 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 on the thinking. Um, and so this somehow relates to how we manipulate these concepts too. So note that when we're manipulating the concepts, we're applying these properties of complex thinking, but we are somehow relating them uh, constantly. So there are different types of constraints that are posed on our thinking. And when we try to play with the complex thinking is also with the creative potential of constraints, with the creative potential of the lack of information, or uh, of the way that a particular type of information was created and try to find other possibilities um, for action. Anna, Anna, si tu me permets, petite euh, suggestion. Il manque quelques minutes pour la, la, la conclusion. Je me demandais si tu pourrais expliquer la plateforme et les liens avec euh, le travail que tu réalises. Uh, this. This. Okay, this. What we're trying to do is to, for now, devise analogical tools and protocols, scripts to guide the process of case conceptualization that, that try to enact some of these properties that we identified that we define as properties of complex thinking. So we've, we've, we've been doing this, assuming that this sort of relational type of thinking where we're somehow relating ideas and then relating relations between ideas and hoping that from this relational um, from these relational movements, when they are recursive to and when a couple of other conditions are present, something new might come about that will then change our experience of the lower level dimensions and all the level, lower level ideas. We've been playing with this idea in different contexts, let me say, not just in clinical contexts, but for example, what you see here is what I call a relatoscope that is played in the form of a game because I have cards here, uh, cards that you can ask for when you're playing that allow you to explore a relation in a particular way or look for particular properties of relation 
or cards that allow you to explore an idea in depth that will change your experience of that um, um, idea. Or you might ask to play with what I call observatrons, which are circular structures that allow you to play with different perspectives on a given situation and the perspectives of different critical observers in a given situation. So what you see here is the result of a relatoscope that was used in the integration of a, of a summer school. So that I use for integration of scientific meetings and dialogues where I'm investigating also processes of emergence and abduction at the level of the thinking and scientific creativity. So what we did here, what you see is this, these are base ideas, the little cards that are put on the table. Um, the little post-its correspond to relations between ideas that were explored. And then the bigger ones or the forms correspond to even higher um, order um, ideas that then we come back and relate again. So what we do with the case is um, not one thing, so I can't explain easily. Uh, and it's still being developed, so I can't tell you what it is. I can tell you what it is becoming. <laughs> Um, what, I, what we're working with, and some of the challenges are precisely to work with flexible enough protocols that um, will allow for the case itself to dictate how we manage our thinking, if you want to. Some properties are there. So what I lay at the basis, for example, with my teams, is that I give them a conceptual model and I give them dimensions to think about. And then we invite them to think about their relationship between each one of these dimensions through the case, exploring different dimensions of themselves also in that relation. And I challenge them a lot. So we use what we call observatrons, like I said, to bring different perspectives into, into, into a case, the perspectives of what might be different critical observers in that um, system of interest. And then what we do is build this. We start to explore relations between ideas. We start to explore relations between ideas and our experience of ideas. And we start to explore relations between relations. And this is just the basic process to work with structural complexity of the thinking, to ensure multidimensionality, to ensure relationality and integration, to ensure recursivity. There are many other dimensions that are added. For example, the narrative complexity, how we're narrating that story, the extent to which the story that we're narrating contains elements of uncertainty and ambiguity and allow for change, the extent to which it represents, it, it allows for different types of values to be enacted for different types of critical observers, the extent to which it allows for these pockets of complexity, for this differentiation of perspectives to, 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 to be reported. Because you well know, for example, that when we're asked for uh, technical advice, like politicians ask us, they ask for solutions, right? They will ask for one single answer. When practitioners like the ones I work with are asked for their technical expertise, they're asked for a verdict about the capacity of the family, for example, to change. And they very close, easily lose the complexity of the case in the way that they organize their narratives. And they very lose because of the way that they're organizing also uh, their, own, their own thinking. So this dimension of narrative complexities is another one that is played. So what I'm saying, I can't tell you, I could, I could, I could play with you and I could um, do this with you. We could do this with the discussions that we've had during the day, for example, uh, and, in, and, and relating our own um, ideas. This could be a way for integrating our final discussion, for example. But what the, some ingredients that I've been working with have to do with this, like I said, the, 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 the relational thinking, the relating relations, the putting, the, the relating our experience of the concepts, the recursivity, um, playing with the timescales, playing with the pathways and the, and the trajectories. One of the things that's quite interesting that I do, for example, is that I invite practitioners to start from a totally different point, like I said, and to explore a totally different uh, tra trajectory, relating things in ways that they have not thought before. And when we do this several times and we explore our experience and we bring about different dimensions into that experience, sometimes patterns start to be noticed. There's a cluster of relations that systematically is highlighted or comes out in our hypothesis. And what we're saying that most of the times those clusters uh, and those patterns point to critical dimensions uh, where, uh, where the intervention may take place and may be more effective. And this is also some of the things that we're um, talking about to some extent, because the way that we organize our thinking is somehow co coherent or congruent with the way that we're all organized and that our world is organized. 
it kind of like reveals to us uh, in um, an abductive way, in um, you know, a nonlinear way, what might be key processes that might be related, more related to everything else and where interventions might happen. And this was particularly important, for example, in cases like the ones I work with, with multi-challenge families, where there are so many dimensions that if you work on a symptom base, you know, you'll end up scattering the family with a multiplicity of interventions that will multiply their problems. So, um, Okay, so pretty much what you see here is, is an exercise of, of that too. You, this is actually a scientific discussion, it's not a case discussion, but you see that the, the relations being played and the different papers representing different levels. These circles here represent observatrons that we move around to play with different perspectives. Uh, and notice that we're not just, we're actually moving the information, that we're playing with ourselves in that information too, and we're allowing for all the modes of knowing to come to play. Um, that's not just about, you know, working with our abstract concepts in an abstract way, but it's bringing them up to the level of our um, experience too. So to some extent, and I'm going to wrap up because I know I don't have time, um, complex thinking would be a sort of star complementarity. Oui, en effet, Anna, je voulais te proposer de aller vers la conclusion. Il va y avoir des questions. Allez-y, allez-y. I'm, I'm, I'm just closing. Uh, I'm just saying that I would see complex thinking as a sort of star complementarity and as coming out, but at the same time underlying that this relationship between being and knowing um, and, 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 and it's playing with, with this dynamic, with this dynamic balance, enacting, like I said, these properties that we have identified in, in, in in systems that show capacity for transformation, that show creativity, they are capable of adapting, of evolving, and hopefully that's what we want our thinking to be capable to do to guide effective actions. So this is probably not the ordered, clean uh, presentation that you would like. Um, any, any way I would have started, I would have been unsatisfied with it anyway, because there was so much to say. So I hope that you have um, just questions that may want to talk to not just today but in all the days and beyond this presentation.